Thank you.
Hello everybody, my name is Phil Holler and I serve on the board of directors for the American Recorder Society. I'd like to welcome everybody to our Play the Recorder Day festivities. Each year for Play the Recorder Month, we commission a special piece of music. And in a typical year on Play the Recorder Day, recorder players will get together and perform this piece of music to commemorate the day. This year, unfortunately, the pandemic has taken away our ability to get together, so we thought that instead it would be fun to get together with the composer of the Play the Recorder Month music and uh, get to know more about her and about the piece of music that uh, we'll be playing. So to that end, we are delighted to have the composer, Malika Fitzhugh, and uh, we have here to interview Malika the president of the board of directors of the American Recorder Society, David Podeski. So David and Malika, take it away. Thanks, Phil, and hello, Malika. It's an honor to meet you and to, and to interview you because I love this piece of music. Oh, it's thank you so very much, much fun and, and thank still you. so so challenging, and it reminds me of one of my favorite jazz musicians, oh, Dave Brubeck. Oh, I love Dave Brubeck. In, yes. <laughs> Yeah, time out, right? Right. Take five. Yeah. Yeah. What was the What was the one? Um, that was a nine. Rondo uh, Alla Turk. Rondo Alla Turk. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I love that one. So, what what inspired you to become a, a musician and a composer? Well, uh, this is going to be a long one, so hold on to your hats. Um, okay. I've always love loved stories. music. I love. <laughs> Uh, I've always loved music. I grew up with it. My grandmother was a Southern Baptist deaconess, so of course I was in church every Sunday and most Wednesdays and occasional Saturday. Um, <laughs> my mom was a concert pianist who had a whole piano bench full of Rachmaninoff and Beethoven, and she also played for our church choir when I was little. Um, I have a vague memory of her middle brother, my Uncle Verdi, playing the banjo, maybe? Um, he definitely played harmonica when I was very, very little, and he might be the one to blame for me uh, wanting to be just like Chuck Berry and Elvis Presley. And I begged my mom for a guitar. So I really wanted to take guitar lessons. And eventually, for my fifth birthday, um, my grandmother and my mother gave in. They got me a guitar, and then they took me to play uh, to classical guitar lessons for three years in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, and I learned Bartok, and I learned Schumann, and a bit of flamenco, and of course, all the finest finger-picking styles of the mid-late 70s. And then I quit in a huff because I hadn't learned blue suede shoes. <laughs> so I quit when I was eight. Um, but a few years ago, I actually taught a student how to play the intro and solos for Johnny B. Good. So at least I got some Chuck Berry in the end. Yeah. But um, my first performances were in church, so it's probably just as well that I wasn't, you know, doing the rock and roll, but I played Bartok and Schumann and, and uh, hymns and such. I love um, Bartok too. Yeah, I love, isn't he great? Bartok and um, Inescu um, for yeah. the, Bartok was Hungarian, Inescu was Romanian, but they were similar in their use of folk, folk tunes in their right. work. Uh, Bartok string quartets I oh, listen yes. to regularly. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I played the third one when I was in college, just a uh, read through Ooh. on viol when I was playing viola. But anyway, but regarding the recorder, I, when I was in elementary school, one had to be in the special music program to get a chance to play the recorder and sing in the chorus for the PTA. Um, but so that's my introduction to the recorder, because I, but because I was such a tall child, I was five four when I was eight in third grade. So I got to play one of the bigger recorders. I think it was an alto. It was the same size as the teacher's recorder. So I was, I was very excited about that. And uh, so that was my first introduction, introduction to the recorder. I think we might have played hot cross buns or something of that nature. <laughs> He's got the whole world in his hands kind of thing. But didn't matter. I just love music still. And then fifth grade, I went into orchestra on viola because seriously who thought it was a good idea to give e-strings to beginners 
on the violin. So I took the viola as my first bow string instrument. And I just really love the mellow sound of it and its portability. My orchestra teacher tried to get me to play upright bass because I, at that time in fifth grade, I was five, ten, three quarters and had a big hand span. But that instrument chooses your vehicles for the rest of your life. So, no, no. But I played percussion. I played uh, timpani and snare and battery percussion throughout high school and in college played in pit orchestras everywhere. But then after college, I went in directly into IT with, because that's what you do. And <laughs> I joined a band called Urban Myth. And the lead recorder player in Urban Myth, it was sort of a pagany, early, early music-y folk kind of band, did a lot of pagan music festivals and such. But it had a core of a recorder and kirtle ensemble that played a lot of Renaissance music. And the lead recorder player was Kathy Rubin. Well, still is Kathy, Kathy Rubin. She taught me everything that I had forgotten from third grade about playing recorder and introduced me to the fact that there are bass recorders and tenor recorders. And so that's mostly what I played in the ensemble. When the kernel wasn't available to play the bass lines, I played bass recorder and I loved it. And um, she had, Kathy Rubin had uh, studied with Marilyn Baino so I kind of felt myself to be a sort of grand student of Marilyn Bano. But anyway, so that was my reintroduction to the to the recorder, playing bass and tenor in uh, Urban Myth and a few other ensembles. Eventually, I joined Quilisma Consort, which is a trio. And I've been playing with them since 2004. We've played a lot of uh, Renaissance, uh, some medieval, like, uh, I love the R. Subtilier. It's my favorite time period in music, I think. So we got to play some Chaconia and uh, all sorts of uh, the De Casertas, Philopactos, and what was the other guy's name? It's, it's gone away from me. Anyway, we played De so, Caserta. So how did you come around to composing? Well, I was composing in high school. I had this grand plan to uh, go to Harvard, study double major in uh, classics and music composition, then go to law school and become a contract lawyer for the National Symphony. That was my grand plan. <laughs> Sounds like a great plan. It was a great idea. Uh, after a 40 minute discussion of Lysias's use of the optative in Greek class, I was like, Ugh. it is more <laughs> fun to read, you know, Latin and Greek classics than to study them. So. I dropped the uh, classics part and just studied music. I was just a composition major. So I studied at the time with Jeff Stadelman and Roger Marsh and while I was at Harvard. And that was great. And I also was in the Wind Ensemble and the Rackle Choral Society. The Wind Ensemble was directed by Tom Everett and the Rackle Choral Society was directed by Bev Taylor. They let me write a piece for Women's Chorus and Wind Ensemble which has never been played again, curiously enough. <laughs> but so that's where I really started composing. Had a bunch of pieces here and there that, that I played. I got played by friends of mine that I could collect together for concerts. And um, I wrote some things for various bands I've been in. I've, I've written for Urban Myth. I've written for the Quilisma Consort. And then eventually I did go back and get my master's degree a couple of years ago at Longy, where I study with John Morrison. And uh, I've been having a lot of fun just creating music, playing music. So do you do you like uh, do you like composing for solo or for ensemble and what kind of ensembles? Well, <clears throat> I would say that I have a s slight preference for ensemble because um, I love to blend or even contrast colors, like different timbres mm -hmm. and such. So having more than one voice, more than one line, um, it, that makes me happy to blend things. But even when I've written for one solo performer, I've always tried to introduce a bit of internal polyphony, uh, even for like recorder or flute, because it's fun to sing along with yourself, right? right. Um, in college, I knew this uh, fellow. He was like one of the youngest math professors. Um, but he was also an amazing pianist. He could hum 
and whistle two different poly um, fully poly polyphonic lines. And I swear he had a third going on with the difference tones or with <laughs> overtone singing or something that was going on. It was amazing. Every time I've tried, it breaks my brain because I move the back of my tongue when I sing and the front of my tongue when I whistle. So I just get really confused whenever I try. It. But it was astonishing when yeah. he did that. So I, uh, I really love having, in any case, I love having multiple lines. And it's a lot easier to play a recorder and on one line and sing a different one. So do, do you, uh, when you compose for, for recorders, um, do you, do you do composers and com recorders and non keyboard instruments or recorders and keyboards or all of the above? All of the above. I have done pieces for recorder ensemble. So multiple quarters, but I've also done recorder and harpsichord recorder and piano. Recorder voice and piano, over recorder voice and harpsichord. Um, I have a quartet that was two recorders, um, bass, viola da gamba, and harpsichord. That works very well. Uh, three recorders and voice, recorder, soprano recorder and guitar. Yeah. That's really nice. Um, soprano recorder and shofar, also quite nice, curiously enough. Um, mm. But my one of my favorites is uh, Sopranino recorder, Kirtle, and chest organ. I'm very proud about that one. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it I, I'm not great. familiar with that. The second instrument you mentioned, Kirtle? Kirtle. Uh, it's the predecessor to the bassoon family. Oh, okay. So just like the Sham is sort of the predecessor to the oboe family, the Kirtle is a double reed instrument. Um, doesn't have as many keys, obviously, as the bassoon, because it was apparently, according to... Uh, Frank Jones, who's a local Kirtle and Sean player, apparently the Kirtle was the hottest instrument in all the dance bands of the 1570s. So everyone who was anyone had one. Great. But I don't know how popular they've been since, you know, 1600. But they're great fun. And there's lots of makers making reproductions, just as there's makers making reproductions of, of uh, recorders and, and such. So do you have a, a favorite composition that you wrote for the recorder? Mine so far is this one. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, actually, I think it's the um, Tally Tolly. That's the one that was uh, for the Sopranino and Kirtle. Oh, okay. And chest organ. Um, that, that one is a lot of fun. And he, um, Frank Jones was the one who commissioned it. And he couldn't remember... He had had he had played this piece with Kathy Rubin. He thought on soprano and kirtle and uh, harpsichord, but he couldn't remember whether it was by Giovanni. Uh, what was it? Uh, I think it was Giovanni Antonio Bertali or Antonio Bertoli. But it turns out I think it was Giovanni Antonio Bertali who wrote it for alto recorder and kirtle and keyboard, but. I did it for Sopranino just because why not? Sure. And it sounds really cool. Um, but yes, I've, I've written a fair number of pieces. I realized last night when I was going through my sort of catalog of pieces, yeah. I have the two solo pieces that I wrote this year. Um, I wrote a solo piece for Emily O'Brien a few years ago for Helder tenor recorder. So that's three solo pieces. And then I have 13 chamber works with other instruments, like the recorder voice and harpsichord and recorder and shofar re recorder and vi um, recorder and guitar and, uh, and such. Um, and then 12 recorder ensembles that are just recorders. So uh, the Boston Recorder Orchestra has performed a couple of my, several of my pieces. Uh, a nonet, a sextet, um, a, a low recorder septet. So it was just all seven um, great and contrabasses. And uh, they were supposed to have done another septet of mine this past May in 2020, but 2020 ceased to exist suddenly. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm hoping that yeah. when we all get together, they can do that one. But I've got, you know, 12 recorder ensemble pieces. 13 chamber works and three solo pieces that involve the recorder. So fantastic. When you, when you begin to compose, do you, what, 
how do you decide what key to compose a piece in? Is it driven by the instrument or it's, instruments? It's driven by the instrument mostly. Um, I don't have perfect pitch or anything. So a lot of times when I'm out and about and I have an idea for a um, bit of melodic material, I carry a plastic soprano recorder in my backpack. So I have something to get some notes and write it down. So it might be somewhat influenced by that, but it, it definitely depends on the instruments and the range of the instruments that I'm that I'm writing for. So it'll be a different key if I'm writing for saxophone than if I'm writing for, you know, violin or something. So every every amateur that's ever tried to write a song wants wants to ask this question of an accomplished mm -hmm. composer. Do you start with the melody? or a chord progression or how do you what what triggers the composition most of the time for me um i start with the rhythmic gesture and then over that a short chord a chord progression will come to me sometimes i'll wake up in the middle of the night with a melody in my head and i'll write it down in the dark or type lily pond code into my blackberry yes i still have a blackberry and i love it <laughs> I don't know what Maybe I'm going to do when 3D goes one. away, but <laughs> yeah, I love white and blackberry. And um, so I use Lily Pond exclusively to make my scores. And so I can just really easily type down, um, you know, A4, B16, <laughs> you know, for whatever rhythm and note and pitch values I need. Hmm. But yeah, uh, more often I will come up with a rhythmic thing and then melodic material will or, or chordal material will appear over it. But sometimes, sometimes in the middle of the night, what can you do? A melody will come to you. So um, what was your inspiration for transparent letters across the sky? Well, as you might notice from the uh, edition, the ARS edition, um, the title comes from a poem uh, that Pablo Neruda did in his book of questions. So it's a whole book of just different questions that he keeps asking. And I was really taken by the that quote, what happens to swallows who are late for school? Is it true that they scatter transparent letters across the sky? I just <laughs> thought that that was amazing. I could see in my mind's eye several strugg straggling swallows with their tiny little messenger style book bags that were allowing uh, letters to fall out willy-nilly whilst the birds were flapping desperately to catch up with their fellows, you know, random T's and S's and likes floating hither and thither, just sort of wafting about. Anyway, whenever I hear something that makes me giggle or go, ah, or something, I will type in it too. Yes, my Blackberry is a possible title or, or some sort of inspiration. I don't even know what I was doing to to stumble across the Neruda book uh, back in, it was the end of 2019. Um, a very, very good friend of mine, it, Jenny Factor is a poet and I might've been talking to her and then we got into a discussion and I went, you know, trawling the internet for more of, of Neruda's poems or something. But in any case, I was really taken by those two questions. The flapping swallows. There's nothing like a great line to inspire. One of my favorites is exactly. um, Charles Dickens' David Copperfield. Mm -hmm. Will I be the hero of my own life or will that station be held by someone else? Oh, yes. Oh, I paraphrase. Yes. I probably didn't get that exactly right. right. right but, yeah. but yeah, I, I know the one you're talking about. That was great. Yeah. Um, can you describe the process that you went through to write this particular piece since we're all playing it right now? <laughs> Well, it's funny, the, the things that I started with, um, some of these gestures of of uh, flutter tonguing and um, sort of crescendoing shh kinds of things, unvoiced T's, they're not in the edition for the ARS <laughs> anymore because I started with those and then I started crafting things around it because like I had the flutter tonguing of the distant flapping wings and and such and then the from there some of the melodic materials sort of coalesce like clouds gathering and reforming first those um opening interlocked rising fifths and then the that rhythmic um material of the uh opening section which of the first section 
which I originally wrote in 17-8, sort of that slow, 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 quick, 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 which has that sort of urgency of, oh dear, we're late, we have to, we have to catch up, but, you know, there's all those S's, uh, and such, and the T's, and, and all those letters were <laughs> flinging themselves out of the messenger bags, but, anyway, so I, I came up with, the, with those things first, and then, some of the melodic material and the rhythmic material. And then there was like that little palate cleanser rubato section. And then the answer to the first section's melodic uh, rhythmic material was the um, quick, quick, slow, quick of the second section. Sort of an answer to the da 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 sort of thing. Um, and so. Then that, and that had that rising line, like, you know, you're drifting on along on a, uh, on an updraft and then you hit a cold pocket and you suddenly fall and then you find another one to drift along and you keep going off into the distance. So you have those distance flapping wings with the, um, flutter tonguing and such. Um, so that was that. And then the third section was this sort of denouement where everything is sort of coming back together down into settling into 4-4 four, four, and slower and slower as the letters are preparing to sort of drift off into nothingness and have that last shh kind of thing at the end. So that's, that's the entire piece right there in yeah, a nutshell. That's very cool. So there are still some unusual playing techniques or playing techniques that some of our members may not be familiar with, mm -hmm. like the, uh, the sag or the sigh. Well, that actually every member is familiar with because it's just a natural part of playing the recorder as you decrescendo. If you don't struggle against it to do alternate fingerings to keep the pitch up, the pitch is just going to sag as you do a diminuendo. So I say celebrate that because, <laughs> you know, most other instruments don't do that. But it's that's a special part of the recorder that you can have this very easy bend, this sort of sighing fall thing. So I wanted to, I wanted to celebrate that in this piece that that is so easy to do, you know, that we have to learn how to counteract it. You know what I mean? We do. Yeah. But so I thought that would be a very easy, so I don't think of it as a extended technique. It's sort of a initial technique that <laughs> you do from the very beginning. Yeah. Em embrace your original flaw. <laughs> it's not a flaw. <laughs> it's a, not a bug, but a feature. That's what I Teacher. say. <laughs> okay. Um, so in any we, ways, for all sort of um, rhythmic musical effects and such, I always just say, throw yourself into it. Do your best. Um, if you're not doing, if you even if you don't think you're doing exactly what the composer asked for, usually these effects are for some sort of timbral change. And whatever you do is going to be a timbral change. It's going to be, it's going to be changing something about the way that the piece feels to you to play or the way that the audience perceives the sound of the piece. So I just say, throw yourself into it, do your best, have fun. Just yeah. like, you know, just relax into it. No matter if it's weird tonguing things or flutter tongue or anything sort of, you know, get your cat purr going, <laughs> you know, and just enjoy it or yeah. your Spanish and such. So. That's what uh, I say. Next question is on a different vein, mm -hmm. um, but something where a lot of us are interested in. When someone commissions a piece from you, do you do you generally have free reign on what you write, or does the commissioner give you direction, themes? How does it, that work? It depends on the uh, commissioner. Um, there's always some sort of parameter or or constraint, like. You know, if I'm told to write a piece, a quartet for recorders, you know, the, then the constraint is the range of the instrument. Um, or if I, I'm asked to write, to set a piece of uh, text the, for a vocalist, then the constraint is the vocalist's rate. So there's always some sort of parameter inherent in everything. I've never been told to just go write something and then, you know, been allowed to do whatever, because it, even if that was 
in college, I was, you know, for, for my studies with uh, composition teachers, I was, I guess I was kind of given that free reign, but then the constraint was who I could convince of my friends to play for me. So then you have, you know, there's always some sort of parameter and I've never felt like I could just do anything ever, <laughs> you know, um, but I actually like working within constraints and, and I feel like whatever creativity I can do within what, you know, whatever, uh, vocal or instrumental range or anything, that's, that's where my creativity gets activated. Yep. So, um, what's, I think you've already told us the most unusual combination of instruments that you've written for. It has to be sopranino, curdle, and, and chest organ. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of the most ones. Um, but there were a couple others in college. Um, I wrote a piece, Anschlichkeit, for viola, bassoon, and uh, glockenspiel. That was kind of unusual. And um, there was another one that I wrote for soprano voice, viola, and timpani. I had a really good friend who was a viola player. That's <laughs> Viola appeared everywhere. Also, you know, I'm a violist, so... Um, but that one said a decidedly not family-friendly epigram by Catullus. So, you know, that's not ever been played again. <laughs> but yeah, the the two two recent pieces that stand out for me, um, not so much exactly for the instrumentation, but for the text, which I was bid to set. Um, one was for three recorders and mostly tenor recorders together and tenor voice. And the vocalist asked me to set three Aztec poems of lamentation. I mean, it was a translation in English, but he still voluntarily sang Nohatl city names. So, <laughs> okay, Elijah, you go with your Nohatl city names. Do your best. But you asked for it. <laughs> and then another one, um, a woman asked me to set SpongeBob quotes. Yes, SpongeBob SquarePants quotes. So uh, that was fun. I sort of did a three movement telemonish mini cantata where I, the melodic material was based on that SpongeBob laugh that <laughs> <laughs> kind of, but I said it for uh, mezzo soprano for her and Baroque violin, Baroque cello and chest organ. <laughs> so it was, it was actually quite, quite exciting. But are there yes. recordings of any of these pieces that we can listen to? Uh, I do have recordings of excerpts from the Lamentations. Um, alas, the uh, the SpongeBob piece, the concert was during the jury graduate recital time for all of the four folks involved. So we only got one and a half rehearsals with everybody. Actually, yeah, one and a half rehearsal with everybody, all four people in the same room. So the um, the concert didn't go quite as well as I would have liked. So, But there is... There is a uh, recording of the la excerpts of the Lamentations. I think that's up on my SoundCloud. Okay. So. And congratulations for having your composition Chronicle of a Pandemic Foretold. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Sarah Jeffrey. On... Sarah Jeffrey. She's so amazing. She is just so wonderfully cheerful and so talented. And I was so thrilled that she agreed to, uh, to play the piece. I, I reached out to her over the summer. Um, just after Eric Haas had had uh, published that second book of solo pieces, you know, mm -hmm. and I, she had just released her CD where she was singing and playing the recorder at the same time. So I was like, hey, loved your CD. I happen to have written a piece that does something similar. And I also wrote another piece, you know, during pandemic times. And I never thought she would write back because, you know, she's professional recorder player in Amsterdam. She you know, has a YouTube channel. I'm sure she hears from hundreds of people a day, but she wrote back like almost immediately and said, sure, I'd love to see them. And she bought the pieces, the scores for me. And then um, I heard from her in late August that she was planning to do a concert and she said she was going to include them. But alas, the concert got canceled because of COVID. But then she said that she was going to do a video of Chronicle uh, like a tutorial video and I was so thrilled and 
when she told me she was going to do it, I was thrilled. And then when I saw the actual video, she's just so enthusiastic and she's so kind and marvelous. Yeah. It was fant just fantastic. Um, I think she was going to try to do another concert this spring, but it looks like that might have been gotten canceled again for COVID because I think Amsterdam was starting to open up, but I guess it got canceled. It was supposed to be this coming weekend, I think. But anyway, in any case, she is so talented, so enthusiastic, and just a marvelous human being. So kind. Yep. She sure is. <laughs> so um, I think I'm at the end of my questions. And unless you've got something else you want to share with us, I'll thank you for being a marvelous interview, fun to talk to. And thank we share you. some favorite musicians, Bartok and, and uh, Brubeck. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. Oh, uh, uh, Urban Myth. We played uh, Take Five, a couple on a couple oh, of yeah. different shows, and um, one of the actually funny enough, one of I play in a, a bass guitar in a Balkan band, which <laughs> might explain my love of Seventeen. <laughs> um, but we were playing a uh, Daichovo, which is a, a, a Bulgarian, Macedonian. Ooh, awkward. I think Bulgarian. Don't quote me. Um, dance in nine eight, but it's one two three four and a one two three four and a. So we did part as sort of like a break from in in the middle of the of that Daichovo. We did Rondo a la Turk, <laughs> <laughs> and sort of and then back into the you know the dance tune, inside. That, that was a great amount of fun. So I just love Brubeck. Love it. So. Um... We'll wrap it up now. Uh, we can direct everyone to Malika's website, which is malikamfitsu.com. Yes, yes, absolutely. Where you can uh, see all of her compositions and and hear some and learn some more about her. And um, immediately after this, stay tuned. Uh, it's going to be the the playing session uh, on here on Zoom and working on uh, Malika's piece, Transparent Letters Across the Sky. I'm so looking forward to it. This is going to be so exciting. Yep, me too. Thanks, Malika. Thank you. Have a have a great afternoon. You too. Thank you, Malika and David. I uh, enjoyed the opportunity to get to know Malika a little bit better and uh, to learn a little bit more about the music that we'll be playing here shortly. At this point, I'd like to introduce everybody to another one of our board members, Greta Hogg Hershu. Greta will be taking over and uh, taking us through the remainder of our Play the Recorder Day festivities. Greta, take it away. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for being here today. I'm Greta. I want to thank uh, Phil for that introduction. Thanks, Phil. And thank you very much, Mel and David, for that great interview. We learned so much from that. It's so nice to hear your insight and learn about your development as a musician as a com and as a composer and what inspired you to compose transparent letters across the sky. In case you don't know, Play the Recorder Month compositions are commissioned at least two years ahead of publication. And they take a lot of work, not only to produce by the composer and uh, you know the composer's creativity and talent, but it's also the dedicated American Recorder Society team that brings them all to life. We have um, our wonderful former board member, James Chaudoir, who worked very closely with Mel to strike a beautiful balance between the complexity of the piece that she intended and to make it as playable as possible for us. So I hope that you will really enjoy playing along with it. Um, so Mel is here now to answer our questions. If you have any, I hope that you've put them in the question and answer um, box below. I see there are a few there now. We'll get started on those in just a minute. If you're looking for it, the question and answer button is at the bottom of your screen, right next to some of the other tools that you might see there. It says Q and A. Uh, you can also put things in the chat if you can't find that or if your particular device doesn't allow the Q&A feature. So uh, my cohorts, Phil Holler and James Lynch, will be watching for your questions. 
So, um, also, I think that we were going to try to put a copy of the score into the chat, but we're having a little bit of trouble with with trying to add the uh, the actual PDF. So hopefully we have a link to the... Uh, Phil, could you put another link to the score in the chat, please? And then if anybody doesn't have it for themselves, you can download it right now while we're doing questions and answers. So first, we have a question from Jamie, uh, or a comment where he says, the Kirtle is another name for the Dulcian, in case anybody was wondering. You might have seen them, uh, those instruments played in Renaissance bands. Those of us who love early music are certainly familiar with it. Kathy R says, I've enjoyed working on love in the time of COVID-19. Malika, could you please discuss the emotions you intend with the various phrases and the, and the fascinating scale from D, including B flat and C sharp? So if we could see you, Mel, that would be great. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. All right. Uh, so the scale uh, is a D minor harmo harmonic scale. So D, E, F, G, A, B flat, augmented second to C sharp, coming back to tonic D. Uh, I love augmented seconds. They're just so lovely that da, 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 da. fantastically mournful and very I, f I find it very emotional whenever I hear pieces that have augmented seconds in it. So that is the scale and the emotions. So the repetition of the, that those first two measures that keep coming back after another measure of something else is sort of, for me, the, how um, days were starting to become indistinguishable from each other a little bit. So there was like this constant is it Tuesday kind of feeling? I don't know what time is anymore kind of thing that's been lingering for the past year. <laughs> but I was feeling it when I was writing this piece for Eric Haas's, um solo soprano collection uh, last March, early April. Um, <clears throat> so the intermediate measures are where something is actually happening in this difference. Some of them are fluttery and anxious, and some of them are just, oh, we're just riding this wave, we're just going along, la la la, um, but always coming back to that same statement. And what I found interesting is that a few of the people who have sent me recordings that they have done, some of them will do the re repeated two measure statement exactly the same each time, which is fantastic. Some have decided to do different nuances within that repeated statement, which is also fantastic. I, I just love the different ways that people have performed this piece. It's been really quite exciting when people have sent me recordings. I'm really thrilled to receive them. Thank you, that's great. A couple of questions that were in the chat. Uh, we have a question, where can we buy your other compositions for recorder? Well, you can contact me via my website and I'd be happy to, uh, to talk to you. Um, I'd be happy to give an ARS discount if you, you know, tell me that you're an ARS member and you saw this, this, uh, presentation. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, just email me and I can, right now I'm just doing, um, PDF scores because I used to go to you know FedEx office to make actual physical scores, but I am not comfortable going into places. I'm very happy in my friend's basement so <laughs> using her Wi-Fi. <laughs> very generous. Thank you, Mel. And so Phil, would you please put um, Mel's website in the chat for everybody as a reminder to them and they can just copy oh, it. It's there. Alice did it. Oh, you just did it. Oh, thank you so much. Very good. Another question, if we wanted to try the special recorder effects not in the ARS edition, can we find them in another edition? Oh yeah, I have that edition available. It, it, there's not a lot of different effects. I replaced most of them with trills and such um, uh, just to you know, make it more actual intermediate rather than in my brain intermediate. Because I was like, oh, flutter tongue, that's, that's fine. Beginners could do that, right? <laughs> 
And James is like, no. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> Another question. Okay. Uh, in a comment to your uh, Nahuatl Lamentations for three recorders, where can we find that? All of it. You just, just email me. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm thinking of setting up a web store. Uh, I haven't done it yet for my website because I just never got around to it. Mostly I've been just handling people as, as they've requested scores. I uh, just send it off to them uh, via email, but just email me or, you know, check out my website. You'll see my, my um, email address there and you can just email me. Give me a couple Perfect. days and I'll, I'll get back to you and we can, we can work it out. For Perfect. Everyone. Perfect. Any Thanks. music that I have that you find interesting, just let me know. Well, I think it's wonderful because here we have music that will live when people play it. And that's exactly what we want, yes, right? Exactly. Yes, exactly. Yes. Another question. Uh, your piece is inspired by Pablo Neruda. Are you mm -hmm. often inspired by poetry? I, well, yes. I've realized that I've either set a lot of poetry, uh, set a lot of, a fair amount of catullus. I've set some um, bits of the Iliad. Iliad, yes, not the Odyssey. I've set parts of the Iliad. So I have did a lot of um, ancient poetry because public domain, yes. Uh, right now I'm working on a piece by my good friend, Jenny Factor, uh, for soprano and um, soprano voice and clarinet. So I'm definitely influenced by poetry this is just like the name, but I, I enjoy setting poetry. I like setting, uh, working with words and and teasing my version of the, their musicality out of them. Cool, that's wonderful. Someone asks, uh, this is an anonymous attendee, so whoever you are, thank you for this wonderful question. Hi Malika, transparent letters across the sky is so visual. I love to see it animated someday, yet it is so sophisticated and complex for listeners and players alike. Do you picture the audience you're writing for as you're composing? Actually, no. I. It's not that I am hostile to the audience I'm composing for, but I always just picture the musicians that I'm, I'm composing for, not the people who would be listening to said musicians perform. So I don't know. Yeah, mostly I'm just concerned with them um, because, like I said, I'm, I've mostly composed things for my friends. And so I'm mostly concerned with, will Lisa and Carolyn kill me if I write this into this piece for Colisma? Probably not. Okay, let's go for it. It's good to have ensemble mates who are um, as generous as yourself. <laughs> Another question. Do you envision transparent letters across the sky for recorder quartet solely? one on a part or multiple recorders on each part? Well, I envisioned it for one on a part, but I think it would be lovely with multiple multiple um, instruments on a part, especially since there's some OSIA parts, like there's some places where you can do octaves or extra notes and you can have one person playing the held note and the other person doing the ba da da ba da da So I think that would be very, actually very cool. That would be interesting, sort of a recorder orchestra. Again, you've you've played with the Boston Recorder Orchestra, which is yes. strictly Renaissance instruments and mostly matched Levirgis, in fact. Mostly matched Levirgis, yes. Yes. I guess so, I borrow my, my friend Carolyn's uh, bass recorder <laughs> for that. Yeah. Well, uh, I've, I've been fortunate to play with you a couple of times myself, Indeed. and I'm really yes. grateful for that. Um, so it's, it's wonderful that you're able to then expand and write for not only modern instruments uh, or modern replicas of uh, Baroque instruments, but also the uh, intonation specificity for Renaissance recorders. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I love the, the sound of mean tone um, when, when things are in particular, especially those fifths. Ah, oh, fifths. Don't get me wrong, equal temperament is lovely. I love being able to play things in all keys on the on a keyboard, like piano or you know, electronic keyboard or whatever. But there is something about those fifths in meme tone or in just intonate, just they just ring forever. I just I 
can only imagine what they must be like in like a cathedral like Gabrielli was writing in or something like if they if they're ringing in you know Lisa's music room which is you know it's in a house so it's small it's not a cathedral how astonishing must it be in those big stone Italian cathedrals and yeah I love temperaments absolutely and the wonderful thing in that regard for recorders is it's such a flexible instrument that mm -hmm. those tonal shadings can be so subtle and so rich so okay. thank you for composing for recorders <laughs> we really appreciate it you've oh, been so it. wonderful mel thank <laughs> you that's the end of our questions for now unless somebody else has another one to add to the list oh, it looks like there's one about uh, the Amherst yes. festival you're right um I'll, I'll just read it aloud so the the attendees can hear it I understand you'll be on an Amherst Festival panel later today, and another of your compositions will be played. What will it be? Excellent question. Um, I have bombarded Letitia uh, Tish Berlin with a bunch of possibilities. I have sent her the um, the. Let me try again in English. I have sent her the YouTube recording that uh, Sarah Jeffrey did of. Chronicle of a Pandemic Foretold. Uh, John Tyson, yesterday, in fact, was so gracious as to record Love in the Time of COVID-19. So I've sent her that recording. Um, I've also sent her, Emily O'Brien uh, did a recording of my sextet with, you know, all six parts. Um, the name of which is escaping me because I used to just call it major minor. What did I? Ah, inexorable, yes. So it could either be inexorable or it could be the two solo pieces I wrote um, during 2020. We'll see what uh, Letitia decides. Play it by the seat of your pants. Well, congratulations on that, on your success and Thank for uh, treating us to this wonderful piece for our Play the Recorder month and Play the Recorder day in particular. I want to thank all the attendees for your question for your questions and to Mel again for being here today, for composing this amazing piece for us, because you've not only enriched our own library, but you've, you've brought this unique piece to the international recorder community. So thank you. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Well, now let's all play Transparent Litters Across the Sky. Have your recorders ready. Uh, Emily O'Brien, our wonderful um, Boston-based recorder professional who is playing the uh, all four parts at once to Mel's direction here uh, will give us a wonderful view of uh, what to play and you'll be able to see Mel conducting just as you did at the beginning in the original video. So follow along with everybody the best you can. Before we actually play you will hear um, a tuning exercise that's being led by Cornell Kindernecht to help you get your recorders ready for the actual tune itself. So have fun and have a happy Play the Recorder Day month. Happy spring, everyone. And we'll see you as soon as we possibly can in person. You'll see me disappear and then here will come the video. Enjoy. In this tuning session, we are going to tune two of our chords. First, we'll tune the chord that we're playing at the beginning of bar two, and then we will tune the chord that we're playing at the beginning of bar eight. So, find bar two, find the note you're playing. Now that you've found your pitches, let's build the chord from the bass up. So, basses come in on beat one, tenors on beat two, altos on beat three, Sopranos on beat four, and then once we're all in, we'll hold it for another four counts. So here we go. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, off. All right, now let's play that chord all together. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, off. Now it's time to tune the chord that we're playing at the beginning of bar eight. 
Basses have a B flat, tenors an F sharp, altos a D, and sopranos an A. Basses come in on beat one, tenors on beat two, altos beat three, sopranos beat four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, off. Finally, let's play that chord all together. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, off.